was an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini that she wore. Hello. Hello. I'm sure you've all heard that song before, and I apologize if it gets stuck in anyone's head for the rest of the day. But I'm wondering if you've ever really listened to the lyrics, because until a couple of weeks ago, I had never really listened to them before, so I'd like to review some of them with you. The first verse goes, She was afraid to come out of the locker. She was as nervous as she could be. She was afraid to come out of the locker. She was afraid that somebody would see. The song continues with her being afraid to come out in the open, so she hides in her blanket. And then she's afraid to come out of the water, so she starts to turn blue. Why was this woman so afraid? The song was released in 1960, 14 years after the bikini was invented in France. Uh, French engineer Louis Rayard invented the bikini. He worked in his mother's lingerie shop and he named it after the site of the atomic bomb testing that year, Bikini Atoll. He thought that the public's reaction would be like an atomic bomb explosion, and he was right. His design was based on exposing the belly button for the first time, and he said it wasn't a true bikini unless it could be pulled through a wedding ring. It was so scandalous that no French model would wear it, so he had to hire a stripper to debut his bikini. Before Rayard invented the bikini, women wore one-piece swimsuits, like this. Or if they were two-piece swimsuits, they were still very modest, exposed very little midriff, and always covered the belly button. Before that, at the turn of the century, women wore these voluminous bathing costumes. And they used things called bath machines. Uh, which were like a six by six by six wooden or canvas hut on wheels. The woman would get inside of the bathing machine in her clothes and then she would change into her bathing costume and horses or sometimes people would drag the bathing machine down to the shoreline and the woman would get straight into the water so that no one would see her in her bathing costume. We have certainly come a long way since then from practically wearing a house, 36 square feet, <laughs> to wearing about 36 square inches of fabric. Um, you go to the beach today, and it seems like everyone is wearing a bikini. But it was not an instant hit in the United States. It was seen as a suspect garland, garment favored by licentious Mediterranean types. In 1957, Modern Girl magazine said it was hardly necessary to waste words on the so-called bikini because no girl with tact or decency would ever wear such a thing. And one writer described the bikini as a two-piece bathing suit that revealed everything about a girl except for her mother's maiden name. Guards at the bikini or guards at the beach would measure bathing suits and women wearing bikinis were sure to get kicked off of the beach. So it's no wonder that the girl in the song was afraid to come out of the water. With the 1960s, however, came the sexual revolution and the women's movement and the rising popularity of the bikini. Soon, no one was afraid to wear one, and in 19, 1965, a woman told Time magazine that it was almost square not to. Last year alone, annual spending on the bikini totaled $8 billion dollars. The popularity of the bikini has been attributed to the power of women, not the power of fashion. And a New York Times reporter called the bikini the millennial equivalent of the power suit. So I'd like to take a couple minutes to examine this so-called power that wearing the bikini brings. A few years ago, male college students at Princeton Univer University participated in studies of how the male brain reacts to seeing people in different amounts of clothing. Brain scans revealed that when men are shown pictures of scantily clad women, the region of the brain associated with tools such as screwdrivers and hammers lit up. Some men showed zero brain activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that lights up when one ponders another person's thoughts, feelings, and intentions. Researchers found this shocking 
because they almost never see this part of the brain shut down in this way. And a Princeton professor said, it's as if they're reacting to these women as if they are not fully human. It's consistent with the idea that they are responding to these photographs as if they were responding to objects, not people. In a separate Princeton study, when men viewed images of women in bikinis, they often associated with first-person action verbs, such as I push, I grab, I handle. But when they saw images of women dressed modestly, they associated them with third-person action verbs, such as she pushes, she grabs. Analysts at the National Geographic concluded that bikinis really do inspire men to see women as objects, as something to be used rather than someone to connect with. So, it seems that wearing a bikini does give a woman power, the power to shut down a man's ability to see her as a person, but rather as an object. This is surely not the kind of power that women were searching for, the power to be treated as an equal, to be seen as in control, and to be taken seriously. It seems that the kind of power they're searching for is more attainable when they dress modestly. But now comes the problem of modesty. The very word modesty is often met with such disdain, especially among the younger high school crowd. I remember speaking to a group of teenagers in New York, and when I mentioned modesty, this girl yelled from the back, what am I supposed to dress like then, a grandma? <laughs> and I was scared. <laughs> um, but I have to admit, I thought the same thing when I first learned about modesty. I thought it meant I had to be frumpy and dumpy and out of fashion, and I imagined myself wearing dresses like this, sitting alone in my living room, never going on another date ever again, and never getting married. And I was particularly frustrated when shopping for a swimsuit when I decided not to wear bikinis anymore, because all I could find were things that my grandmother would actually wear. Instead of being discouraged, I took matters into my own hands and I designed my own swimsuit. And the first time I wore it, a few girls asked where I got it, and the second time a few more, and so on and so forth. So I decided to put my MBA to use, which made my parents so happy, and start my own swimsuit company. My goal is to disprove the age-old notion that when it comes to swimsuits, less is more and that you can dress modestly without sacrificing fashion. My inspiration for my swimsuit line is Audrey Hepburn, who is timeless and classy and who happened to have dressed very modestly. I don't think people think of Audrey Hepburn and think frumpy dumpy and out of fashion. These are some of my designs. And my tagline is, who says it has to be itsy bitsy? Well, to answer the question, if you look at today's society, everyone, everyone says it has to be itsy bitsy. Fashion designers, the media, and let's face it, sometimes parents. Little girls would not be running around in sexy underwear and skimpy bikinis if it wasn't for their parents buying them for them. I believe that the woman was afraid to come out of the water because she had a natural sense of modesty about her that has been stripped away by today's culture. And we need to bring it back. I have dedicated a lot of my time, I travel all over the country speaking to girls about this issue. I've just written a book called Decent Exposure about it. And we need to teach girls that modesty isn't about covering up our bodies because they're bad. Modesty isn't about hiding ourselves, it's about revealing our dignity. We were made beautiful in his image and likeness. So the question I'd like to leave you with is, how will you use your beauty? Thank you.